In Acts chapter 23, we see that Paul is brought before this council. The end of 22, of course, um, is when the, the Jews were, were beating Paul. And you know, the chief captain comes and he delivers him out of their hands. And Paul tries to speak to him. He said, you know, he says, give me license. And he, and he tries to talk to him. They get upset again. The captain comes and he brings them into the castle. And um, he was going to beat him. He finds out he's a Roman. And he, and he doesn't beat him. And then he says, um, he, you know, this, the, the chief captain wants to know what's going on. So he said, okay, tomorrow we're going to have a council. Your accusers are going to come forth. And he said, we're going to get to the bottom of this matter. And um, basically that's where we're at now in chapter 23. So they call the council, they call all these people together that are going to accuse Paul, and um, Paul starts speaking to them in verse number one. He says, And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. So here we say Paul's just getting started speaking. He's just, he just says his first sentence, he just says, look, I've lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. You know, basically saying, I'm not just some wicked sinner. He's like, everything that I'm doing, I'm doing with a good conscience toward God. As soon as he says that, the high priest commands that they just hit him in the mouth. They're just like, just hit him. And Paul says here in verse 3, it says, Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. For sinnest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to law? He's like, why are you hitting me? He says, God's going to hit you. You're hitting me. God's going to hit you. You're commanding me to be hit contrary to the law when I'm speaking according to the law. And you're supposed to be a judge of the law. You're supposed to be the one judging the law. Yet you're having me smitten. You're having me hit contrary to the law. He said, God's going to hit you. Now, what we see here, what the, the wording he used, he calls them the whited wall. And... Um, it's kind of an interesting phrase to call someone, you know, what's a whited wall? But this reminded me of Matthew chapter 23. You could turn there if you would real quick. Keep your finger in Acts chapter 23. We're going to turn back to Matthew 23 because we're going to see Matthew 23 is where Jesus really lays into the Pharisees. Where he calls them the, the, the scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. And he goes on and on and really just, just tears into them, really lays into them. Um, and mostly for their hypocrisy. But look at Matthew 23, verse 27. The Bible says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. So we see here, Paul called him a whited wall. I think that's probably really similar to what Jesus said. He called them whited sepulchers. Of course, a sepulcher is like a tomb. It's a grave. It's, a, it's like a coffin, right? It's something that's used to hold a dead body. And he said, you're, you're like unto a whited sepulcher. Yeah, on the outside, it's real ornate. It's real beautiful. You know, someone probably crafted it and made it look real nice. But inside, it's full of dead men's bones. So you can look at it and say, oh, yeah, that's real beautiful. And inside, it's just full of death. And, um, and I believe this is similar to what Paul is calling them. And Jesus said, look, and he's talking to the Pharisees, which is exactly the company that Paul is speaking to. He's talking to the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Jesus said, look, outwardly you appear to be righteous unto men. You look like you're obeying the law. You look like, oh yeah, you're so, you know, you're so righteous. He says, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Now, why are they full of hypocrisy? Because they say one thing and they do another. That's what hypocrisy is. And that's why Paul was calling them hypocrites. He said, look, you're supposed to judge me after the law. You're supposed to use the law as the standard. And that's how you're going to judge me right now. Yet you're telling them to, to hit me, to smite me, which is contrary to law. You know, there's no reason that Paul needed to be hit then. So he's calling him a hypocrite. And, you know, we need to be aware of hypocrisy. Hypocrisy abounds. And that's actually a, one of the main reasons why people don't even go to church these days. And I know that's actually one of the reasons that kept me out of church for a little while. And again, there's no good excuse not to go to church. You ought to go to church. The Bible tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. 
We need to go to church, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We need to be in church more and more. Just because some other people are hypocrites doesn't give you an excuse not to go to church. Look, if God commands you to be somewhere, if God commands you to go to church, then you go to church. Regardless, he doesn't say, well, unless they're hypocrites, then don't go to church. But I got news for you. Everybody, to some degree, is a hypocrite. If you say that you believe the Bible, you believe every single word in this book is true, well, you're still a sinner. And there's something here that you're not doing perfectly, so to some level, you're a hypocrite. But when the Bible talking about hypocrites and it's talking about people, you know, um, doing this, um, having this type of hypocrisy, it's not the, the hypocrisy that I just mentioned of, well, to some degree we all are. This is talking about people who are blatant hypocrites, where they're going to stand up. Like if I were to stand up here today and say, you shouldn't drink alcohol and tell you not to do that, and say it's wicked, it's a sin, you shouldn't do it. Now, would that be true? Yes, that is the absolute truth. That's what the Bible says. But if I'm then going out and doing that thing, then of course I'm a hypocrite, right? And um, that's exactly what the Pharisees would do. They would, they would lay all these burdens upon the people and say, you need to do this, you need to do that. And they weren't doing it at all. And like I said, this is a big reason why people don't go to church. Because they see, they'll hear you say, oh, well... You know, the pastor said not to do this, and this is wrong, this is wrong, and then I see him going around and doing the same thing. And what does that do? It's a poor testimony. Why would anybody want to follow you or listen to what you have to say if you're saying one thing and you're doing something completely different? And, um, you know, I believe as a Christian, it's all of our responsibilities to do with the best of your ability to live according to, to the Bible and to live according to what you claim to believe. I mean, that made me, if you're a hypocrite, that even makes, can make people doubt their own salvation. And again, I know this from personal experience. I got saved when I was 20 years old. But since that time, I've done a lot of things that I knew I shouldn't have been doing. Some things maybe I wasn't fully aware of because I didn't know the Bible that well. But there's a lot of sin. Look, there's a lot of sins. I don't care if you've never even read some of the scriptures about drunkenness. You know it's wrong. You can see the fruit. You can see what happens when you go to the bar. You can see the results of getting drunk. And you just know God has given us a conscience. God has given us, and especially if you're saved, you got the Holy Spirit. You know when certain things are wrong and when certain things are wicked and certain things you shouldn't be doing. Okay? Whether you've heard them or not. But there's a lot of things that I did hear as well. And I still did them. And it got me to the point to where I would have to question myself and say, am I even really saved? I claim to myself, and I, and I believe this, I believe it in my heart. You know, I believe the Bible. If I believe it so, I ask myself, why am I not doing it? Why am I still doing these sins? If I believe that I shouldn't be doing this stuff, then why am I going out and doing it? And you got to watch out for hypocrisy because hypocrisy is wicked. Like it's, 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 hypocrisy can cause you to doubt yourself. Hypocrisy will definitely cause others to doubt you, not have any confidence in you, and not be able to trust the things that you say. And it's important that people can trust your words. That you can be a man of your word. You can be a person of your word. When you say something, people should be able to believe it. And, and one of the ways that they can understand that and they can believe you is because... They can see, oh, okay, well, here's a person that believes in the Bible. Here's a person that believes what God says. And I can look at their life, and I can see that they're doing exactly that. That is going to get you um, a lot farther with people. People have a lot more trust and a lot more respect for you when they can see that you're living the life that you're preaching. And this is exactly what Jesus was talking about in Matthew chapter 7. Turn back there, if you would. Matthew chapter 7, of course, is a famous... Very famous portion of scripture that so many people like to quote and misquote these days. They'll misquote Matthew 7 verse 1 that says, Judge not that you be not judged. They'll just say that and just, and just like that's it. That's the end of the story. There's not even a rest of the Bible. There's not a rest of that chapter. Just judge not. And, and usually it's not even the whole verse. They'll just tell you, oh, judge not. Oh, you're a Christian. Oh, judge not. Well, let's see what this what this verse is even talking about, what this section of scripture is even talking about. we got to keep reading. See, it's important when you read the Bible, read it in context. And not just to pull out one small phrase or one small verse and just say, see, you can't judge, no judging, no judging at all. Look at verse number two. It says, for, which means because of, so the reason why he's saying judge not that you be not judged, 
For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. So he's saying, look, if you're going to judge, just, just know this and beware. That whatever judgment that you're saying in your casting, hey, it's going to come back to you too. You're not above this. You're not some judge that's above the law. Whatever, you, whatever you're saying is wrong to do, whatever you're judging in, hey, if you do the same, it's going to come right back on you and you're going to get judged. The same way. It says in verse 3, it says, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? So now he's using an illustration. Using a moat is not very common in today's, in today's language, but a moat is basically just some small little speck, some small little piece of dust or dirt or whatever. He's saying, look, you're looking at your brother's eye. You're looking at someone else's eye, and you see this small imperfection, this small problem that they have, right? You see this small speck of dust. He says, yet you don't consider that you have a beam in your own eye, some huge, you know, some huge piece of wood just sticking out of your eye. And obviously this is like an exaggeration, right? This is, a, this is trying to get a point across, this illustration. So he's saying, you're so focused on the smallest thing about somebody else when you have huge sin in your life. You have a really big problem. He says, hey, look, you need to take care of your problem first. And that's what we see here. Look at verse number four. It says, or how wilt thou say to thy brother... Let me pull out the moat out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. He's saying, look, how are you going to be able to pull that little speck of dust? How are you going to help that small imperfection that's going to require some kind of sight and vision to be able to see clearly and to be able to have that type of level of precision to deal with those small matters when you have a huge problem, something extremely big impacting your own vision? Verse number five, this is where we get the full meaning in the context of verse one, judge not that you be not judged. Verse 5, thou hypocrite. He's talking about hypocrisy. He says, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So he's saying, look, the first thing you need to do is to get that big beam out of your eye. He says, look, look at yourself first. Take care of that big problem. Take care of that big sin in your life. Get that out of your life. And then does he say, and then don't worry about your brother, and then don't judge your brother? Is that what he says? And then don't try to help him, and then don't try to get the sin out of their life? No, that's not what he says at all. He says, then shalt thou see clearly. So he said, look, if you see clearly, is it okay to, to, to help your brother and to cast that mote out of their eye? Absolutely. Then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of that brother's eye. You see, if I was just living an extremely wicked lifestyle, just full of sin, full of debauchery, just full of wickedness, would I really be the one that should be standing up here and telling other people, hey, don't live a life of sin. Hey, you need to live a righteous life. No, of course not. I would be an extreme hypocrite in that situation. But if I'm up here and I am living a good life, I am, and I am living, you know, not extremely sinful life, you know, I don't have all these various sins in my life, and then I try to tell other people, say, hey, you know, this is a problem for you. You, you might have this problem in your life. You have this mode in your eye. And I want to help get it out. See, it's not good to be walking around with stuff in your eyes. You want to get it out. And sometimes you might need someone else to help you get it out. I know my daughter's come to me many times. She'll get her eyelashes stuck in, or folded up in her eyes. And she'll have problems like that, and it hurts. Right? Does that hurt, Elizabeth? When that happens, yeah, it hurts. It's not fun. She goes through some pain. And it's interesting, too, because it's such a great example. Now, they don't know, she doesn't want you to go near her eye and to touch it. She doesn't want, if she does, she wants you to help and fix it. But she doesn't really want you to, to, to go in and do it. Because a lot of times when you go in and do it, there's still going to be even some more discomfort. Because you can manage, you can kind of hold your eye and, and get it to a, n a more numb type of a pain where it's, you know you don't like it, it's very uncomfortable. But as soon as you start going in there and messing with it, well, now it's going to start to hurt even more. And so the extraction, the fixing, the problem, sometimes will end up hurting a little bit, a little bit more, but then the end result is, okay, now I'm fixed, now it's better. And it's the same way with sin in our life. You want someone else, well, you, you know, if your heart's right with God, you should want somebody to point out an area of your life where you're not doing right by God. 
where the Bible is clearly saying, hey, look, this is a sin. And if I'm sinning, I want to know about it. I want someone to tell me. Now, it might hurt. You might, you might hear it get preached. You might hear it get ripped on. You might hear like a music, a sermon like I did on music, the devil's music, and be like, man, that, you know, that's going to hurt. I don't want to get rid of all my worldly music. I love it. it you know, it's something that, that, that really you know, speaks to me, and it, it's a part of me. And it might hurt to get rid of it. It might cause you a little bit of pain, a little bit of suffering, so to speak, and, you know, emotionally, just, just detaching yourself from this. But I'll tell you what, I guarantee you, look, you get that sin out of your life and you're going to be a much better person. You'll be in much better shape. You'll be able to see a lot more clearly on these things that are wrong. And I, and I guarantee you this, this is the same way with television, with the music. Look, you don't always see it when you're in the middle of it. You're blinded a little bit. You don't quite get it. But you get this stuff out of your mouth, I'll, I'll give you a challenge. Don't watch the TV for a month. And then if you go back and, and, and instead of watching the TV, get your nose in this book and read the Bible and listen to some preaching and then turn that TV back on. When you've been distanced yourself away from it, when you've pulled it out of your life, if you'll be able to see a lot more clearly, wow, that really is wicked. Oh, I didn't even notice that before. All these things start to jump out at you a lot more obviously than they did before when you were in the middle of it, when you had that sin in your life. It's the same way with the music. You tend to have a tendency to look over these problems. You have a tendency to look over the, the things that are wrong because you like that sin so much, because you're clinging it to so much. It's like you're holding your eye. You don't want anyone to touch it. You're like, I'm okay with this. But if you let that person, if you let someone come in, you let God come in and purge that sin, the latter end is going to be so much better and you'll be able to see clearly. But I'm so sick of people these days perverting God's word. Say, oh, no, you can't judge. Oh, you can't tell someone they're wrong. Oh, you, you can't say anything like that because you have sinned. You're a sinner, so you, you can't, you know, he is without sin, cast the first stone, so you can't say anything. That's not what that verse is saying at all. It's not what that passage is saying at all. He's saying not to be a hypocrite. He's saying you shouldn't be doing the same exact thing that you're telling other people not to do. Let's continue reading. Turn back to Acts chapter 23. That was verse number 3. Look at verse number 4. It says, And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. Now, this is brilliant. This is a great strategic move by Paul. This isn't going well for him. We al he already knows these people want to kill him. They tried to kill him twice. They tried beating him and, and killing him. He, he got, you know, the, the, the army came and, and rescued him, and then he wanted to speak again, and then they tried to kill him again. So now he's sitting in the council. He already has gotten punched in the face as soon as he starts to speak. So he's looking around and he sees what's going on. He says, okay, you got this whole council of people. Well, the one part's Pharisees, the other part's Sadducees. Now these are two different sects of Judaism. These are two different groups of people, two different denominations, if you will, of people who follow Judaism religion. And, um, and he notices this and he sees this and he's able to use this to his advantage. As soon as he sees that, that the, there's the Pharisees, the Sadducees, he says, okay, I'm going to use this to my advantage. And um, basically he's able to pit them against each other and take the focus off of himself. And this is a really wise thing to do because he didn't have a good situation, a good way out of this. But um, let's keep reading here. We're going to see a little, we're going to get into this just a little bit more. So he's basically saying, okay, I'm going to side myself with the Pharisees so that they can just, so I can get out of this mess and that they can start fighting among themselves. Verse number seven says, and when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and Sadducees and the multitude was divided. So he's just like, 
He's just starting a fire. I mean, you see this kind of stuff all, all the time on the internet. Like, people will come in, these trolls will come in, they'll throw something out there and just watch all the chaos and watch the people going back and forth and fighting. And um, that's basically what he did here. He said, okay, I know this is a real, this is, this is the main sticking point between the Pharisees and the Sadducees is the resurrection. He said, look, the whole reason why I'm even here, the whole reason why you guys are talking to me is because I believe in the resurrection. So he's, he's just saying in real general terms, this is what I believe and that's why I'm standing here today. So now, the Pharisees are going to look at that and say, oh, well, they can't back down from their doctrine because they believe in a resurrection too. And they don't want to give in to the Sadducees who don't believe that there's a resurrection. And um, so let's, so we see here in verse number 8, it says, For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Now, what I think is also a little bit comical about this is that they're both wrong. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're both wrong. They're both false religions. They're both preaching and teaching something wrong. Now, they're contrary to each other, but they're both wrong because it says the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, which we know that there is. Of course, that's true. That's true when Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And we will also be raised, risen from the dead when, um, when Jesus Christ comes back and he gives us a new body. We're going to be raised from the dead. It says, but the Pharisees confess both. Now, both meaning angel and spirit. Now, does the Bible ever talk about an angelic resurrection? The Bible doesn't talk about angels being resurrected from the dead. It talks about humans being resurrected from the dead. Never once talks about angels being resurrected from the dead. The Bible doesn't say it. It says that the, the angels aren't God's children as we are. And it doesn't ever mention them having a resurrection. So here, you got the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They're both wrong and they're both fighting with each other. And that's like so, and, and this reminded me of, see, we don't really have a Pharisee and a Sadducee today that have these exact beliefs. But you know what? One thing we do have today within Christian beliefs is Calvinist versus Arminian, right? You have so many people saying, oh, well, if you're not a Calvinist, then you're an Arminian. No, I'm neither. Because guess what? They're both wrong. Calvinists are wrong. Arminius is wrong. The one says that, that the only way that you know you're saved is if you per per persevere or you endure unto the end. Then you know that you're saved. Whereas the other one will say, well, no, you can actually lose your salvation. They're both wrong. And they're both extremely dangerous doctrines that are sending people to hell. Because it has to do with salvation. It has to do with our eternal souls. And this is what the doctrine is, is referring to, which is exactly like what the Sadducees saying, there is no resurrection. Well, hey, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you don't believe that, you're not saved. That doctrine is extremely important. It has to do with salvation, just like these other perversions of the gospel have to do. But let's dig into Calvinism a little bit more, because... This one is really popular today, and it's popular even among Baptists. So I want to get into this a little bit. And basically, what Calvinists believe, it's, there's this, they have this stupid acronym. It's called TULIP. And this is just the five main points of what they believe. Now, Calvinism and Arminianism, first of all, the first, the first thing that you should notice as to why these doctrines are incorrect is because they're just named after a man. It's like, oh, I'm a Calvinist. Just like people got rebuked in um, 2 Corinthians saying, oh, I am of Paul, and I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Christ. You know, people are just following a man instead of following God's word and following the Bible and following Jesus Christ. That's who, you know, you ought to get your authority from and what you believe from Scripture. But when you just start following a doctrine that's just created and made up by a man, I mean, he's the founder of it. He made it up. So this doctrine technically didn't even exist until some man just created and said, this is Calvin, or other people called it Calvinism, because that's what John Calvin taught, because he was new and he was the founder and creator of this. This is not some doctrine that's been around forever. It's a doctrine that he created. The same thing with Arminian. I don't, I don't know um, the, the, the guy's first name, but um, that's, that's named after a man as well. So what do they believe? So first they believe in, in the T and Tulip is total depravity. They believe in the total depravity of man. That man is just completely depraved, you know, can't do anything good, can't do anything right. They're just completely and utterly and totally depraved, which is nonsense. We, um, <clears throat> you know, the Bible says that we can, um, that yes, we are born with a sinful nature, but we're not just completely depraved. 
Um, <clears throat> God, for one, for example, God can hear our prayer when we call on Him to get saved. Okay, that's a great example of, of the fact that we're not completely depraved because we could hear the gospel and we could choose to receive the gospel. And that leads us into the second point where it says unconditional election. Unconditional election is basically saying that there is no condition to set to, to salvation. It's just God chooses who is going to be saved and who isn't. So basically what unconditional election means is like standing for, if God, if God were to be here and you just see the group of people, you say, okay, you're saved, you're not saved. You're saved, you're saved, you're not saved. You're not saved, you're not saved, you're not saved. And basically that for no other reason other than the fact that God is God, God just says, you're going to be saved and you're not going to be saved. And they say that's called the sovereignty of God and God chooses and he says there is no condition, there's just, the, God has just chosen people to be saved. Completely false. What, what do you think about Romans 10, 9? It says that if, now that word, that if, okay, I'm a computer programmer, the word if, that's a conditional statement. In writing code, you have if, then, else statements. Those are all called conditional statements. Condition means that there's, conditional means that there's some type of condition. In order for this to happen, this has to be true, or this has to happen first. It says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So the condition is first, look, in order for you to be saved, the end result is getting saved, right? In order for you to go to heaven, in order for you to be saved, if you have to do something, there's a condition to that. You have to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. It says, if you do those things, then you shall be saved. Then you are saved. That right there is a condition. So this unconditional election is garbage. It's not biblical. Limited atonement. That's a T-U-L. L is limited atonement. Okay, limited atonement means that Jesus Christ did not pay for the sins of the whole world. To say it's limited. It's only for the elect. It's only for who God chose to be saved. He said those are the only people who have their sins covered. Those are the only people that Jesus paid for their sins. Again, completely unscriptural, completely unbiblical. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But even more proof is that in 1 John 2, 2, says, And He is the propitiation for our sins, talking about Jesus Christ, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The whole world. It's not limited just to us only, as John was saying, hey, John, the Apostle John was saved. And he says, look, he didn't die. It wasn't a propitiation just for our sins, just for us who believe. He says, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus died for the sins of every single person in the whole world who's ever lived or ever will live. Of all time, Jesus Christ died and paid for every single person's sins. It's not limited to a few. God, and that's the whole reason why the Bible can say God's not willing that any should perish. God doesn't want anybody to die and go to hell. That's not His will. Which is why Jesus Christ came and paid for everybody's sins. But he left it up to us. He gave us a condition that we can choose to put our faith in him and get saved. And that's why any person, every single person's world has a chance to get saved by putting their faith in Jesus Christ. The eye. The eye is irresistible grace. They're saying, if you're going to get saved, it's irresistible. They're saying, you cannot resist God's grace. They say, if well, God calls you, if God has chosen you, no matter what you do, you think you have free will. No matter what you try to do, you cannot resist the grace of God. There is nothing you can do about it. If God's going to do it, then you are just, He is just going to make you do it. Again, another fallacy, another, another completely unbiblical statement. Acts chapter 7 verse 51 says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. So here we see people that the Bible says they were resisting the Holy Ghost. Well, if it's irresistible grace, you can't resist it, right? Well, I hate to burst your bubble, but the Bible says contrary. 
And then the P part of tulip is they say the perseverance of the saints. So they say, okay, those that are saved, they are going to endure unto the end. They are going to persevere. They're going to keep the faith. They're going to do everything right. They're going to, they're going to stay faithful all the way into the end of their life. So according unto this doctrine, I guess they would say that Saul wasn't saved. They would say that, that probably even Solomon wasn't saved because he didn't persevere unto the end. He built altars unto false gods because his wives turned his heart away from the serving of the Lord. But that's, that's nonsense. What there is, instead of perseverance of the saints, what we believe is that there's a preservation of the saints. God preserves our soul. God preserves our spirit. God is the one who will... That's why we have eternal security, because He gives unto us eternal life. God preserves us. God seals us with the Holy Spirit of promise. And He'll preserve us all throughout our lives, whether or not we choose to obey Him or not, whether or not we choose to follow God. And that Calvinistic doctrine is a doctrine straight out of hell. It's sending people to hell. It's doing all kinds of damage to the church. It's telling people that basically there's no reason to go out soul winning because there's this irresistible grace and if God calls people, hey, it doesn't matter what anyone says or does, they're going to get saved no matter what. And if God's chosen it, there's nothing anyone can do to help that or to hurt that. And then what's going to happen is going to happen. So hey, what's the point of going out and witnessing to people? What's the point of even giving the gospel? And it's also saying that, hey, you don't have to choose to believe on Christ because if you're going to get saved, you're going to get saved no matter what. It's nonsense. And then the Armenians claim that you can lose your salvation. They don't believe in the eternal gift, in the eternal life. They think you just walk away from it. They're both wicked, dangerous doctrines. The Bible says in the hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Of course we have eternal life. It's going to last forever. Now, these doctrines are extremely important. And this is not just something I'm splitting hairs over. This isn't just some small detail of like, oh, well, you believe this way, I believe this way. It's a little bit different, but it's not that big of a deal. This is talking about salvation. This is all about people's souls and whether or not they're going to heaven or hell. And this is what people are getting taught. Now, just because the Pharisees and Sadducees aren't around today, these Calvinists and Arminius are around today, and it's a dangerous doctrine. And, you know, there's nothing new under the sun there's been this type of debate and, it's, and these people going back and forth, all these false false believers, you know, people who don't believe in Christ, just, just pitting themselves against each other. And you see that today. There's so many denominations out there that they have all their different um, false doctrines that they believe and they fight against each other. But, um, you know, we shouldn't get too caught up in that. But it's interesting here how Paul is able to use that to his advantage. But let's keep reading here in Acts 23. Look at verse number 9. It says, And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man, but the spirit or an angel has spoken to him. Let us not fight against God. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castles. Now again, we see that the captain's got to send his soldiers down because he's afraid that Paul is going to be ripped into pieces because the Pharisees are on one side saying, no, it's okay, you know, hey, if an angel's talking to him, if, you know, then, then let's not fight against God. The Sadducees are saying, no, there is no resurrection. They're, you know, they're fighting against each other. So basically this turns into chaos. The, the captain sends his men and he gets them out of there. Verse number um, 11 says, and the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. So now here we see that God reveals his will a little bit for Paul. And he explains to him, he said, Okay, look, I know you've been, you've been going through all kinds of stuff and they want to kill you and, and they've been beating him. And he says, um, he says, Don't fear, you know, it's okay. Because he, Paul even said multiple times when he was going down to Jerusalem, he said, I'm not only willing to be bound, but I'm also willing to die for the Lord Jesus. So I think he kind of had it in his head. He's like, this might just be the end. And he was just going to stand strong and just, just keep the faith and whatever comes may come. But, you know, God tells him here, he says, okay, look, you know, be cheerful. He says, the same way that you've testified of me in Jerusalem, he says, you know, you're going to testify of me in Rome. Basically, he's telling him, you're going to get out of this. 
Now, it's also interesting, too, because this is going to come into play later in chapter 25. It's two chapters later in verse 25, because this isn't over yet, this council. Even though you know he had to be taken away here, he still has to be, you know, they still have to do something with him. Because they're still accusing Paul, so the, the law has to, has to be dealt with, has to deal with the situation with Paul somehow. So it kind of gets, gets kicked on up in the court, so to speak, and gets escalated. And in chapter 25, we see here where he's being tried again. In verse 11, it says, For if I be an offender, have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things, whereof they accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. So Paul invokes his right as a Roman to basically appeal his case and to go straight to the top, like to the Supreme Court, essentially, and to be appeal unto Caesar. And of course, Caesar is in Rome, and um, I think that one of the reasons why Paul was even did that, he knew that was the will of God, because God told him, told him that, hey, you're going to bear witness of me in Rome. So Paul understands this, he knows this ahead of time, so he says, okay, when he finally, you know, he pleads his case, and he sees it's not going anywhere, and they're trying to just send him back to the Jews so that the Jews could kill him, he says, no, I appeal unto Caesar. So that's kind of interesting. But that's gonna, we're going to see how that plays out later in the next couple of weeks as we keep going through the book of Acts. But let's, let's continue reading here. Look at verse number 12 of Acts 23. It says, And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. And they were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. Now, I find it funny these days. I looked up the word conspiracy in the Bible. I've done this before, but I did it again tonight or in preparation for the sermon. It said, um, basically, the word conspiracy is found ten times throughout the Bible. And it's funny how today, I mean, this word conspiracy has probably never been a problem throughout history, but today it's turned into this, this word that the media has spun. And basically, it's a word that's used to make people look crazy and just to discredit their belief, discredit the things that they're saying, just by saying, oh, you believe in a conspiracy. And they'll use words, they'll, they'll, they'll say it with intonations like that, just to try to make you look or sound crazy as if, as if a conspiracy, just because a conspiracy exists, that somehow you're nuts and you're paranoid and that you, you know whatever you think is ridiculous. You get labeled a conspiracy theorist. And again, this, you know, this term is usually used in a derogatory manner that somehow is supposed to discredit you, what you have to say. Now, I'll tell you right off, right off the bat, I believe in conspiracies. The Bible talks about conspiracies. These men had a conspiracy to kill, to kill Paul. What does that mean? It means they conspired. They made a plan. They bound themselves with an oath and a curse. They said, hey, look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to bring evil upon this, or this person, and that's what we plan on doing. And that's called a conspiracy. And if you think that there's no wicked people out in this world today that are planning to do evil, wicked things unto other people, then you are just completely naive or just out of your mind. And you have to just completely out of touch with reality. Because the Bible talks over and over again about how many wicked people there are in this world that hate God, that don't rest, that don't give their eyes sleep or slumber, like it says in Proverbs, until they have done mischief or until they have caused some harm to somebody. There are people like that out there today. They're conspiring. There are people, there's the adulteress, right, who lies in wait. They set traps. They hunt for the precious life. There are wicked people out there that are conspiring and planning to do evil, bad things. And you say, oh, you're this conspiracy theorist. Yes, I am. And if you are persuaded and fooled into thinking that that's something derogatory, to think that just because there's wicked people out there planning on doing wicked things, if you think that discredits somebody, then you're the fool. But I'll tell you what, that here in this church, this church is filled with people who are interested in the truth. Now, the truth, sometimes there is a conspiracy. Sometimes there's people conspiring to do wicked things like they did to Paul. Sometimes there's not. Either way, what we're completely interested in is the truth. And I love, I love the truth. That's why our, our church is called Word of Truth Baptist Church. Because we're interested in the Word of Truth. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's good. It doesn't matter if the truth is bad. It doesn't matter if, 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 if it's not pleasant to hear. If it's great to hear. 
Whatever the truth is, that's what we want to know. So you call, call us, we're part of a truther movement. Now, I've noticed that there's basically two main reasons why people do not want to hear the truth. One of those reasons is because there's just so many evil, wicked people that hate the truth. They don't want to have their sins exposed. They don't want to have the light shining on them. They want to hide in the darkness. And maybe they're the ones conspiring. Of course, the ones that are conspiring, they don't want the truth to be told or known what they're planning on doing. They want to keep it a secret. They want to keep it a conspiracy. They don't want anyone to know about it. John 3, verse 18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, talking about Jesus Christ, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. This is the reason why people like darkness. This is why people don't want to hear the truth. This is why people... Don't want the light to shine. The light, the truth of the gospel, they don't want it to shine because their deeds are evil. And if you're doing wicked things, if they're doing bad things, hey, they don't want other people to see that. They're trying to hide it. It says, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. you are saying, look, if you do the truth, you're going to come to the light. Because you're not afraid of the light. You're not afraid of the works that you do being made known to people. Because you're doing that which is right. You're walking upright. You have a clear conscience before God. You can, you can walk in the truth and say, hey, bring the light on. I love the light. I want more light. But people who are doing wickedness and evil and doing all kinds of things, hey, they don't want the light shining on them. And the other reason I think why people don't want to hear the truth is because, quite frankly... Oftentimes, the truth hurts. The truth is, can be painful to hear. It's not pleasant. And that's what the Bible tells us and warns us in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. It says, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. He's telling them, Look, you need to preach the word. You need to preach the truth. You need to tell people that they're wrong. You need to correct them. You need to exhort them. In all long-suffering and doctrine, you need to preach the truth. But it says in verse 3, why? Why is it so important? It says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Fables are just stories, just made up, they're lies, they're not truth, they're not real, it's just, it's just a make-believe story. And that's what it's saying people are going to do. They can't endure the sound doctrine. They don't want to hear it. It cuts to their heart. It cuts into their sin. It shines a light on the wickedness. And after they're all lost because they like their sins, they don't want to hear about it. It says they heap to themselves teachers. They, they get themselves teachers. They say, look, what we still want to be taught, we still, we, still, we still love God, but we want someone that's going to just stand up there and tell us what we want to hear. We don't want to hear the truth. Just make something up. Tell us what we want to hear. Come on. Tell me that, that, I'm, that I'm living a great life. Tell me that I'm doing so good and God's happy with me and God loves me. And tell me that there's nothing wrong and I'm a great person and I'm just living right. And, and that's what I want to hear. I don't care if it's not true. I don't care if it's a fable. That's what I want. I want you to tickle my ear. And I love that, that itching ears. I think of our dogs. You know, dogs love having their ears scratched. And a dog comes up to you and you, you start scratching their head, you start scratching their ears, and they love it, and they'll put their head in your lap, and they just love getting that scratch. They love getting their ears scratched. And there's a lot of people that treat church the same way, that treat serving God the same way. They just want their ears to be tickled. They want it to be scratched, like, oh, yeah, that feels so good. Oh, come on, tell me some more. Yeah, oh, yeah, I'm a great person. Tell me, tell me how good I am. Tell me how much my sin is. Is really not sin. Just keep telling me lies. And that's what people are like today. And, and we were warned about it here. That's why we need hard preaching. That's why we need to hear the truth from God's Word. And that's why here, I'm not interested in tickling your ears. I'm not interested in scratching your ears. 
I'm interested in getting that mode out of your eye. I'm interested in getting that beam out of your eye. I'm interested in you growing closer to God. I'm interested in helping you to get the sins out of your life. And the way that the, one of the best ways to do that is first to shine the light on them and expose them. And say, thus saith the Lord. This is what God actually said. This is what God actually thinks about divorce. This is what God actually thinks about fornication. This is what God actually thinks about the music that you listen to. This is what God actually thinks about your sin. He hates it. He doesn't want you to do it anymore. And that's the type of preaching they need. That's the type of preaching that's going to help you. And that's what we stand for. We stand on the word of truth. We stand on God's word. And that's what we're going to preach here. And that's what we love and that's what the way this church is always going to be as long as I have any say in the matter. Let's keep reading here in Acts chapter 23. Look at verse number 12. It says, And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves with a curse, that, um, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. And there were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. Verse 14 says, And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great curse, that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. So um, we see here that it says they, they bound themselves under a great curse. Now, a curse, a lot of people don't understand what curse is. You know, people think like if they say some four-letter word, they say, oh, I cursed. Which, that's not really necessarily a curse. A curse is when you, it's basically the exact opposite of a blessing, right? So most people probably have a good understanding of what a blessing is. When you receive something good, when someone does something nice for you or wishes some kind of, of, of good or some kind of benefit for you, hey, that's a blessing. When, um, when you know, the Bible says that, that children are an heritage of the Lord and they're, you know, the fruit of the womb is his reward, children are a blessing given to us from God. Hey, the more children you have, that's a blessing. Hey, having a child, that's a blessing from God. It's a great thing to have. They're going to bring you joy and happiness. It's such a, such a great thing to have children. That's an example of a blessing. The curse is the exact opposite. It's when someone is wishing evil or bad upon you. And here they were, they were swearing or cursing. They were making an oath to do evil. This is the curse that they made. Is that They bound themselves. They, they swore. They made an oath and said, We're not going to eat or drink. We're not going to do anything until we kill Paul. They're trying to bring evil to him. Obviously, they're trying to kill him. That's what the, the curse is. And we see here in verse 21, if you jump down real quick, it says, in, it says in verse 14, we have bound ourselves under a great curse. And when Paul's nephew is explaining this to the chief captain, it says, um, but do not thou yield unto them, for there lie in wait for him of them more than 40 men, which have bound themselves with an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now are they ready, looking for a promise from me? So basically it's saying, you know, that great curse was, was equivalent to an oath. Now, but the oath, the reason why it's a curse is because what was the intention of the oath? What were they actually trying to do? They were actually trying to hurt him and bring evil upon him. That's what a curse is. But let's keep reading here. We're going we're gonna to quickly kind of go through the rest of this chapter. Verse 15 says, Now therefore, you with the council signify to the chief captain that he bring him down unto you tomorrow, as though you would inquire something more perfectly concerning him. And we, or ever you come near, are ready to kill. So basically, they're setting the trap, right? They're, 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 again, to go back to this conspiracy, they're, they're laying wait. They're saying, okay, here's the plan. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to go to the chief captain. You're going to say, hey, we want to talk to Paul again. We, we want to understand what he's saying a little bit better, a little bit more perfect. We want to get a full understanding. So can you just, just bring him out again? And, and we just want to talk to him. We just want to get this matter settled. And just understand exactly what you have to say. So they're going to go to him with those intentions. And their whole plan, the meanwhile, is saying, look, we've already decided that as soon as he comes out, as soon as we see him, there's 40 of us. We're going to jump in and we're going to kill him. And we're not going to eat. We're not going to drink until we, you know, we're, we're going to make sure that Paul dies. We bound ourselves under this curse. Now, what's interesting is that there's conspiracies like this going on all the time. I know it's a fact because there's a lot of wicked, evil people out there. But the, the, the media that we have today, they would take a story like this, right? And um, let's say Paul's nephew were to go, you know, or go to someone like he did to the chief captain here. And then 
Someone else tries to speak out about it. Like, nephew tries to speak out and say, hey, they're going to kill Paul. Hey, don't listen to him. They're just going to say that they want to talk to him, but don't listen to him because they got other plans. If this were happening today and he tried to go to the media with that, the media would say, if they heard about, about Paul's nephew saying this, they'd say, oh, yeah, you're just some conspiracy theorist, right? You just think that people are out to kill Paul, right? Oh, yeah, ha, ha. Yeah, you're, you're nuts. The same way they do with... With um, with 9/11 and the you know and the and the planes that that hit the twin towers, they say, oh yeah, oh you think that there's people in government that are wicked? Oh you think that 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 this was planned by someone other than some men in a cave that 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 have a shoestring budget that didn't know how to fly at all? You think you think that <laughs> you think that um, you think that there's some evil people that that pulled this off that that knew about it beforehand? Oh you're a conspiracy theorist. And this is the way that the media would react, and that's the way they always do when they're in on it, when they're and when they they don't love the truth, and they don't care about the truth, but they just care about spinning things, and they're they're ultimately just mouthpieces for evil people. <clears throat> but we see here, let's just, I might get back off of that that conspiracy thing, and back to the story here. It says because Paul's nephew basically finds out about this. Finds out that they're set in a trap, they're laying in wait, and he tells Paul about it. So then Paul, in verse 17, it says, He called one of the centurions unto him and said, Bring this young man and the chief captain, for he hath a certain thing to tell him. So he says, Okay, I want you to tell the chief captain. He doesn't tell anyone else, he just brings it to the ears of the chief captain. So, so he took him and brought him to the chief captain and said, Paul the prisoner called me unto him and prayed me to bring this young man unto thee who hath something to say to thee. Then the chief captain took him by the hand and went with him aside privately and asked him, what is that thou hast to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to desire thee, that thou wouldest bring down Paul tomorrow into the council, as though they would inquire somewhat of him more perfectly. But do not thou yield unto them. That word yield is, a, is an older word. It's not really used too much today. But you sometimes you see traffic signs that say yield. And it's that upside down triangle. And yield just means um, basically to, to allow someone else's uh, to go. You know, like for in traffic, it's, you know, your yield, you don't necessarily have to stop, but if there's another car coming, you have to yield to them. You have to allow them to go first. And what he's saying here, he's saying, don't yield to these people's demands when they're going to ask you, say, hey, we need Paul to come down here so we can talk to him again. He's saying, don't give in to them. Don't let them, don't let them speak to Paul. Don't bring Paul out before them. Don't yield to them. And it says, for their lie and wait for him of them more than 40 men, which have bound themselves with an oath, that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now are they ready, looking for a promise from me. So the chief captain then let the young man depart and charged him, See thou tell no man that thou hast showed these things unto me. And he called unto him two centurions, saying, Make ready two hundred soldiers to go to Caesarea, and horsemen three score and ten, and spearmen two hundred at the third hour of the night. So now he's making this, this huge troop. I mean, a centurion is someone who's a captain basically over a hundred soldiers. That's what like the word century is a hundred, a hundred years. But um, a centurion is a, is a man who's, who's in charge of a hundred soldiers. So he calls two centurions, 200 soldiers. He says, get 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen. That's a lot of people to be put in company with Paul. Um, and, and it's interesting here because I don't think he likes Paul that much. He's obviously doing this for a show. He's, one man does not need... I mean, he told him that conspiracy was for 40 people. Okay, 470 people, 70 of them on horseback against 40 people who want to kill Paul. Probably a little bit of overkill. But we're going to see exactly why he's doing this. And it's, it's a little bit interesting. We're going to wrap it up here. It says... Um, it says in verse 24, And provide them beasts that they may set Paul on and bring him safe unto Felix the governor. And he wrote a letter after this matter. So now he's going to send this letter along with them to Felix and explain what's going on. It says, Claudius Lysias unto the most excellent governor Felix sendeth greeting. This man was taken of the Jews and should have been killed of them. Then came I with an army and rescued him, having understood that he was a Roman. Now, is that what really happened? Or is he embellishing this a little bit? He's embellishing it quite a bit. Because he's just saying, oh, you know, this guy was going to be killed by the Jews, but I came in and I rescued him. I understood he was a Roman. I brought in my army. I rescued him. When really what happened is that he saw these people beating Paul to death. He came in and he did rescue him. He did take him away. But 
he was about to beat Paul. He was about to, he, oh, he bound him, he chained him, and he was about to whip him, and then he found out that he was a Roman, and that's when his, that's when his attitude kind of changed. But um, he does all this, and, he, and he, um, he writes this great letter, and he's sending this big troop to just kind of show how much he's really just putting forth this great effort to save that Roman citizen, and basically to puff himself up kind of as this great hero, right? And then it says um, in verse 28, And when I would have known the cause wherefore they accused him, I brought him forth into their council, whom I perceived to be accused of questions of their law, but to have nothing laid to his charge worthy of death or of bondage. He's saying, look, I, they had some kind of dispute with them about their law. He said, but, but nothing that I can see even you know, worthy of death, which is what they're trying to do, or even of bonds, even to put him, even to put him in prison or put him in jail. He's like, you know, to keep him from his liberty. Now, I didn't see anything like that. So now he's sending it to sending him to to um, to Felix, so that Felix can could figure out what's going on with this. It says in verse thirty, and when it was told me how that the Jews laid wait for the man, I sent straightway to thee and gave commandment to his accusers also to say before thee what they had against him. Farewell. Then the soldiers, as it was commanded them, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. Now, this is kind of interesting, too, because look at what it says in verse 32. It says, And on the morrow they left the horsemen to go with him and return to the castle. Now, do we see here the soldiers, the centurions, they just bring him to Antipatris and then they leave. I think they realize, like, this is overkill. Okay, we don't need this huge army to go with this one man just to, to bring him there. Because the commandment that, that Lysias gave them was in verse 23, it said, And he called on him two centuries, saying, Make ready 200 soldiers to go to Caesarea. And horsemen three score ten and spearmen 200 at the third hour of the night. So the, chief, the, the Lysias is telling them, You need to bring him to Caesarea. But what happens is basically they go to Ant Antipatris, which I don't know the geography that well to know how far that is, but basically they take him through the night to, the, to a, one of the closer cities, and it says that on the morrow they left the horsemen to go with them. So basically in the morning, you know, they, they went with them a little ways, and then they're like, okay, because Paul was already on a horse, they could get there a lot faster. They're just like, okay, the horsemen, you could go, we're going back into the city. So they just, they just go back, and... Um, they returned to the castle. Verse 33 says, Who when they came to Caesarea and delivered the epistle to the governor, presented Paul also before him. And when the governor had read the letter, he asked of what province he was. And when he understood he was of Cilicia, I will hear thee, said he, when thine accusers are also come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's judgment hall. And we're going to get in chapter 4, of course, again, another prosecution, another um, story where they bring this case against the Apostle Paul, and that's going to be next week. Let's borrow as a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. Lord, I thank you for the great truths that you have. Lord, I pray that you would please help us to learn from um, these great stories in the book of Acts. And I pray that you would please just help us to be steadfast in our faith, dear Lord. Help us not to be moved by these, these people who believe in false doctrines, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just keep us safe from evil. Uh, we know that there's conspiracies out there. We know that there's evil people that are always trying to, to work against good and to work against you and your words and your laws, dear God. But I pray that regardless of how many of these people there are, I know and I'm confident that you are able to protect us, dear God, and our faith is in you. And we're not going to be wavered, dear Lord, but we're going to be faithful unto the end. And we love you and we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.